Have you seen Damasio's new book? That's what I had yelled at me the other day. It was Richard L.V. yelling at me, have you seen Damasio's new book? I said, what's that? He said, it's called Descartes' Air. I said, I'll love it. Anything antithetical to Cartesian thinking, I'll love. So I went over there to the bookmark and uh, picked it up, and who should I run into but my friend and colleague, Mark Kruger, who is also there trying to find Descartes' error. We purchased the books together. I read mine. <laughs> we'll see, Mark. <laughs> It's a wonderful book. I'm going to call this a landmark. For years in education, we have taught that cognition, affect, and psychomotor are separate domains. We've taught them as stair steps, beginning with knowledge, ending with synthesis and evaluation and cognition. This book calls into question all of those old paradigms. I invite you to interact with it and uh, see what you think. I want to introduce now Antonio R. Damasio. He has a medical doctorate and a doctor of philosophy. He is the M.W. Van Allen Professor of Neurology and head of the Department of Neurology at the University of Iowa College of Medicine in Iowa City. He is also adjunct professor at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies in La Jolla. He is internationally recognized for his research on the neurology of vision, memory, and language, and also for his contributions to the elucidation of Alzheimer's disease. The center that he and his wife, Hannah, created at Iowa is acknowledged as the leading facility for the investigation of neurological disorders of mind and behavior. He is a member of the European Academy of Sciences and Arts and of the Royal Academy of Medicine, a fellow of the American Academy of Neurology and a member of the American Neurological Association. He received the Beaumont Prize of the American Medical Association and recently shared the Pessoa Prize with his wife. May I present to you Antonio Damasio. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, I must tell you before I start that uh, Paul just asked me to sign his book. And I said, after your introduction. <laughs> but now I will sign it. Um, I would like to, to, to thank you for your very kind introduction. And I would like to thank the organizers of this uh, beautiful conference for your hospitality, but mostly for inviting me. It should be fairly obvious that we're all having a great time on the, this side of the stage. And so I think we should congratulate the uh, casting director of this play because I cannot think of many other groups of colleagues and friends that I would rather be with today than the ones that are gathered here. Well, uh, let me say that we have a title for this conference, The Unlocking of the Brain, and uh, it's quite obvious from uh, everything one hears about brain research and from the fact that several thousands of people are here listening to us, that there is an excitement about what we call neuroscience. And I would like to tell you, first of all, what I think the excitement is all about from my perspective. And there are, of course, many, many reasons for that excitement. But the main ones for me is that for the first time in the history of science, all levels of neural organization are accessible to scientific inquiry. This is really the first time that it is happening in a consistent way, but it's quite obvious, and it will be obvious to you uh, by the end of tomorrow, that everything from the molecules that Eric Kendall and Anders Bjorklund will talk to you about tomorrow to the systems that David Ubel and I and Pat and, uh, and Oliver Sachs will, will tell you about uh, can be now approached. And what is most exciting about it is that not only can you do research uh, in, in, in traditional scientific uh, sense of the term at all those levels, but you can establish interrelations between those levels in a vertical way. 
And we have for the first time in front of us the prospect of joining the fields that have traditionally been called or, or subsumed under biology and the fields and the aspects of inquiry that had been subsumed under the term psychology. And uh, when we do that, we also have another great prospect is relating the ensemble of both biology and psychology in modern terms to the fields of knowledge that have been traditionally in the social sciences uh, and that really relate to and, and to other uh, uh, sciences that relate to the physical and social environment with which we interact. So it's a time of excitement and since there was a mention of Descartes already. Uh, let me say that it is a time in which the uh, uh, views, the quite well-known views of Descartes on this matter, are really falling by the wayside. If Descartes is known for something, it is known for the separation between biology and the mind, and that is certainly falling uh, before our very eyes. Now, let me turn to uh, a little bit of the approaches that we use in the kind of, of, of science we do. And there are two that are very important. One is known as the lesion method, and another is now also quite well known, and it's under the term dynamic imaging. And what we do uh, with, these, uh, with these approaches is complement a lot of knowledge that is gathered in the study of, uh, of animals uh, with knowledge that is gathered in human beings, sometimes perfectly normal human beings as we are, without any medical problem, other times individuals that have a problem, generally a neurological condition that has led to damage in a specific part of the brain. And I would like to have a first slide and to tell you that the way in which we do this today is very different from the ways of the past. And the most important point to remember is that we really use lesions in the brain, an area of damage in one point of the brain, such as, for instance, the occipital cortex that David Hubel told you about this morning. We use that lesion as a probe to the behavior of a system uh, that we have hypothesized. So we begin by having a hypothesis about how a collection of areas in the brain ought to work, and then we test the hypothesis by placing, as it were, lesions in different points of that system and deciding whether or not the results of that, those lesions accord with our prediction. So in a way, there's a, a, a commonality of approach with many other aspects of neurobiology. For instance, this is not unlike what you do when you do gene knockouts in uh, mice, for instance, and you are trying to study certain systems. It's not totally unlike what you do with drosophila mutants, for instance. Uh, and the, the other main aspects that are different in the current approach to this, uh, to, 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 to this aspect of neuroscience is that we use many exemplars, many patients that have similar conditions, similar lesions, so that we can really do systematic studies, we can make comparisons, we can control the results. Perhaps most important of all is the fact that we have now, unlike was the, the, the case in the past, we have now the possibility of knowing about the neuroanatomy, uh, the state of neuroanatomy in vivo, that is in the living human brain. So here you have this brain that you're looking at, and you see all the marvelous detail of the gyrus uh, and, and sulci. Uh, you're seeing it in many different uh, views. And most of you would be tempted to think that this is really a post-mortem brain, it's something that came from an autopsy, and uh, the meninges were very beautifully cleaned, and this was the result. Well, I have news for you. This is actually the brain of Pat Churchland. And uh, uh, so this is obviously a very, very important, very important thing because, first of all, we can now say that uh, it, 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 we can certainly deny the, uh, the statement that uh, all philosophers do not have brains or that some philosophers do not have brains. At least we know for certain that Pat Churchland has a brain. Uh, we knew that, but it's, it's sort of nice to know. Uh, and it's also a beautiful brain, it's very perfect, it has all the components. So when, when she talks to you um, a little later, you, you will realize why she's so eloquent. Uh, now, how was this obtained? Well, this was obtained from a magnetic resonance scan with very fine resolution in MPAD, could have been obtained in any of us in this room, and it is done from a marvelous collection of uh, slices, and it was then reconstructed using a methodology that was developed by Hannah Damasio and Randall Frank at her laboratory. 
And what it permits is do these studies, which are really very perfect. And now you're looking at another brain and you're seeing the marvelous detail that this can produce at the computer screen. And you can see how important it is to have the information about the state of that particular brain uh, when we are doing an experiment in a particular person. Now, uh, you can cut this brain, any brain, in any slice, in any direction that, that you wish, and you can do this uh, on the moment uh, at the computer screen. You can relate information from two-dimensional slices, as you have on the right-hand side, to the three-dimensional volume reconstructions of an entire brain. Uh, you can do something quite marvelous, is that you can look at a lesion that is in a particular uh, locus, let me see, David, if I'm luckier than you are. Here it is, a lesion in this location, and you can study exactly the position in which that lesion is relative to landmarks, and you can do it you know, on that particular individual, and therefore you can uh, quantify the size of that lesion, you can uh, uh, quantify it relative to that unique brain, and then relate it to the unique results of the experiment that you have been doing in that person. Furthermore, you can relate all of these landmarks to the skull, to the scalp itself, and by doing so, allow for the development of new methodologies in dynamic imaging. One that again has been developed in Hannah's lab, it's called Pat Brain Vox, and she and Tom Grabowski have developed that, and it allows us for the first time to look at anatomical hypotheses in the studies of dynamic imaging using what is called positron emission tomography, or PET, which I know many of you have heard about from, uh, from uh, reports in newspapers and television. Now, let me give you a quick example of what one can achieve these days using some of these methodologies. And I'm going to start by uh, telling you a, a little bit of an ongoing result in the area of language, which is obviously something that interests all of us here. Well, you're looking at a slide, which in our laboratory is known as the Christmas cookie slide, uh, and it, it shows in different colors the key areas of the traditional map of language regions in the human brain. You have the famous Broca's area, the famous Wernicke's area, which is here, and then areas such as the angular gyrus and the supramarginal gyrus, and an area that goes by a number rather than a name, and that's area 37. Well, this is the state of knowledge of language systems that we inherited from 100 years of neurological case studies and that was in fact prevalent uh, at the time of my mentor, Norman Gashrin, who uh, uh, revived and continued many of these studies into the late 20th century. It was one in which the, pre the, the, the prevailing idea was that these different areas acted as centers that were capable of an enormous amount of processing and would do such things as auditory comprehension, the production of syntax, and other such. And it was, as you can see, relatively limited in scope. Only certain spotty areas of the left hemisphere were involved. Well, the news that I want to bring today is that, first of all, it is quite clear now that the way these so-called centers operate is in a very uh, systematic and integrated way. We really do not have anything we can call centers, rather we have systems that have multiple components, and they work in concert, and they span large aspects of the brain. Very often they span an entire hemisphere. The second thing is that far more than just these areas are now being discovered using the appropriate lesion method and PET experiments. And let me tell you about something extremely simple. It's a study that has the same kind of simplicity in terms of the stimuli that David Hubel demonstrated this morning. Sort of the equivalent for language of using a bar across the visual field in order to get at the responses of cells. And what we're using in a study that has involved so far 151 patients with damage all over the telencephalon is a task, I'm just going to concentrate on one that requires naming, that is the produ production of a name to a stimulus, and that involves, as you can see up top, stimuli that are divided in different groups. One is of pictures of common entities, things like manipulable objects or animals that you can see out in the street. Uh, another 
pictures of unique entities, which are more often than not unique familiar faces or unique landscapes, and another of pictures of actions. Let me just show this very rapidly so that we have an idea of what a patient is confronted with. You have here a couple of screwdrivers of different types, an animal that you will recognize, uh, an action that you will recognize also. Here what counts is not the broom or the person, but in fact the action, the sweeping action of that particular uh, duo. And you have a face that you will recognize also. These are all presented in, in blocks uh, to these subjects. And let me tell you what we have found, and just give you a, a couple of examples to give you the flavor of the enormous selective organization of the human brain. For instance, we have found that there are patients that will behave this way. Here's one patient that shown concrete entities and asked to produce names will behave quite poorly and will not in fact be capable of coming up with more than about half of the total uh, number of names. And when you compare to the performance of the controls that are matched for age and education, you realize that it is many standard deviations away from it. However, look at the, this beautiful discrepancy. When that same patient is asked to name actions, such as, for instance, the sweeping, the patient has no problem whatsoever. So there is a complete sharp separation between the ability to conjure up the name of an object and the ability to conjure up the name of an action. And this is something that is extremely consistent and is observed over and over again and is also stable across time when you change the stimuli and you retest the person. Let me tell you that so far we have found out of that 151 pool of patients, 14 that have this kind of behavior, when this slide was made there were only three, and the lesions systematically cluster in the left temporal lobe anteriorly, that is in the, in the front part of the temporal lobe as it were. They're on the left side only, not on the right, and they are in this location. Now, for those of you who remember that previous cookie, uh, Christmas cookie map, you'll realize that this region was not part of the traditional language areas. So it is, in, fa in fact, part of a system that handles uh, one particular aspect of language processing, which is the conjuring up of a lexical entry so that you can produce a name. And this is something that is part and parcel of the very large scale system that operates language. Now, let me show you something which completes the picture. Here we have another patient, KJ, that falls abysmally when it comes to coming up with the names for actions, but look how he performs when he has to come up with names of concrete actions, of concrete entities. He's as good as the controls. Here, there is a very large area of problem. Now, let me tell you what the nine subjects that so far have been shown to have the problem with naming of actions uh, do in terms of their lesions, and their lesions are located in left frontal region, but never in the temporal region. So what we have here is what is called in classical neuropsychological uh, uh, methodology a double dissociation. Those individuals that have trouble conjuring up the names of objects fail uh, when they have lesions in left temporal lobe systems, but those individuals that fail to have, the, that, that do not have that problem, but fail instead to have a problem with actions, have lesions in the left um, frontal lobe system. What this is telling us is in fact something that ought to have been quite intuitive, but we didn't intuit. And that is that uh, the brain honors the distinction between making representations of objects that generally are in fact uh, centered around a static representation of objects in a particular canonical representation and the representations of the actions that those objects can make in space-time or the actions that those objects can be made to make in space-time. And it is not uh, a coincidence that, in fact, the brain chooses to have the, the naming function for objects at the very tip of the temporal lobe, 
which contains the end point anteriorly of the chains of visual processing that begin in V1, as David Hugel showed you this morning, and that instead it plays the one, places the ones that have to do with actions at the end of chains that originate in the parietal cortices, which are fundamentally related to properties of movement in space-time and the displacement of objects in a three-dimensional space. So this actually makes quite a lot of sense from the point of view of the brain. And the interesting thing is that it is coming to us from the results of studies of patients with lesions in different locations. Now, let me tell you that this result has now been completed with a study uh, using uh, labeled water, uh, O15, in, in PET, positron emission experiment. And this is an experiment that was carried out by Tom Grabowski, one of our colleagues, and Hannah Damasio. And it's a really heroic experiment in the sense that it now has 28 normal individuals. And what the individuals were asked to do were, was in one condition to look, at an, to look at a name of an object, take the word apple, and read it out aloud. In another, to look at that name, but come with a generation of the word that represents an action tied to that object. So in one case, you would read out loud the word apple, but in another, you would have to come up with a verb, such as, uh, for instance, bite or eat. So what we're trying to do in this experiment is get at the fact that the brain is honoring this distinction between the ability to come up with words that correspond to nouns, in fact, common nouns, and the ability to come up with words that correspond to verbs, that correspond to actions in space-time. The result of this experiment, which is analyzed with a variety of uh, very complex analyses, both CDA, which is developed by Mark Rakel and his group, and Pat Brain Fox, which is the one developed in our lab, what it shows is really quite remarkable, is that the generate task, this task in which you generate a verb, activates systematically a region which is contained here by the yellow contour, and which is actually the region that corresponds to the area of damage in patients that have problems with generating, with, 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 the, with the, uh, producing verbs. So we have now from two different methodologies, one that uses lesions and produces a deficit, and another that looks at the normal brain and asks for a task that corresponds to the one that is defective, we have now this very marvelous uh, correspondence pointing to the same system. This, by the way, is one individual, and this is the mapping of the activity in that particular individual uh, during, the, uh, during that task. And it is shown on the 3D reconstruction and also shown in here uh, in a coronal cut. And you see the, the slightly colored area that corresponds to the peaks of activity. Now, we'll skip that, and let me tell you another very quickly about another experiment, also with PET. This is an experiment that is ongoing, and the analysis has only been done in eight of the subjects, in which we ask the patients to produce naming, again, trying to probe with a different approach, the kind of results that we had with lesions, and we ask the patients to name known faces, such as JFK, as you saw, the naming of animals, or the name of manipulable objects. So there were three entirely separable conditions in which people had to produce the names uh, to, to, to these different areas. And of course the hypothesis, which I'm not going to give you in detail because it requires a long story to give you the full rationale, is that different systems will be handling these different processes. And we have in fact quite a lot of results from lesion studies uh, uh, supporting the idea that manipulable objects are going to be handled largely by posterior systems on the left, that the naming of animals is probably going to be a, bi a bilateral process and is more anterior in the temporal lobe, and that the naming of faces is even more anterior. Well, let me show you. Uh, I'm going to ask you to concentrate on these three columns with colors one corresponding to the activity for faces, another with the activity for animals, another the activity for tools. And these two slices, the one on top and the one on the bottom, correspond to those two levels, those two blue lines that Hannah has run across 
that particular brain of a particular subject that is depicted there on the side. And now I'm going to ask you to look intently at the color red, which corresponds to the areas that on the average produce the peak activity. And I'm also going to ask you to realize that the left side is on the right and the right is on the left. Now, when you look at tools, you realize that there, the activity is maximal in the left hemisphere rather than on the, left, on the right, and it is maximal actually in this region, which corresponds to about this point, which is exactly the place where, with lesions, we have seen problems with the naming of manipulable objects. Here, we have the activity that corresponds to the animal naming task, and it is remarkably different in position from this one, and for one thing, it does not respect anymore the unilaterality of the process of manipulation. And finally, look at what happens with faces where the process is pushed forth into, in fact, the tip of the temporal lobe, quite remarkably on the right, on the left, and actually produces negative activities in the posterior regions. This is quite fascinating because, in fact, in another study that is being done by another colleague, uh, we have found that the activity, that lesions in the anterior tip of the temporal lobe on the left are excellent to produce a loss of the ability to name unique individuals while preserving virtually everything else in terms of language capacities. So, as a whole, what you're seeing here is the possibility of these methodologies enlarging the scope of our knowledge about the brain at the level of large-scale systems. So that if you would now ask me about the map of language-related areas, instead of the Christmas cookie picture that I showed you, at, showed you at the beginning, we would now have this much larger area that continues to enlarge. The thing to remember is that the area enlarges, it corresponds to different systems, but the different systems are made of se several and separate components, although they interact by feedforward and feedback connections. Now, let me uh, change gears and tell you about something which I would like to be the, the, the main topic of this, of this conversation, and which has to do with notions such as emotion and rationality. And I would like to start that story by invoking an individual that many of you have heard about. He's a famous patient from the last century called Phineas P. Gage. And this is a patient that probably would have been uh, as well known as the patients of Paul Broca or Carl Wernicke uh, had his doctor, uh, John Harlow, been able to obtain an autopsy in the patient and been able to relate the problem that the patient had to a particular area of the brain. Unfortunately, he didn't. And all that was re recovered of that patient was the skull. And this year, uh, Hannah uh, in her lab was able to produce a reconstruction of the possible uh, passage, the area of possible passage of the iron bar that destroyed one part of Gage's brain uh, and therefore complete in a way, obviously tentatively, uh, what, uh, what John Harlow started. Now, what John Harlow did was describe uh, in 1868, pretty much at the same time that the first language related uh, patients were being uh, described, described that this individual who was young, uh, promising, uh, socially adapted, very capable and responsible in his work, had turned overnight into an individual that although, for all intents and purposes, he appeared to be able of body, able of language, able of intellect, he was no longer able to have a sense of responsibility in terms of his work, he no longer could be trusted, not that he was criminal or anything like that, he just could not be trusted with the kind of responsible job that he had, uh, he used profanity uh, in front of people where before he had not, and clearly something major had happened in his personality, and something that quite particularly had to do with the ability to govern his life in a way that would be uh, uh, conducive to his betterment and uh, uh, consonant with the kinds of rules uh, that society had taught him and the kinds of principles that one might call ethical principles. So this was what was lost in Gage. Now, 
throughout the, the rest of the century and then in the 20th century, other patients were described with similar conditions, this time now with some knowledge about, about the areas of brain that were damaged, and the clear relation was established between frontal lobe structures and this kind of disturbance that would not cause a major intellectual loss, but at the same time would render an individual incapable of steering his behavior in society. And the troublesome thing was that the analysis almost always yielded a great paradox. You had people that went overnight from being proper uh, adapted individuals to being uh, 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 marginal, and you also had at the same time an enormous preservation of the instruments of intellect. Uh, so that when people struggle to find problems with language or memory or working memory or uh, a logical capacity, ability to calculate attention and on and on, you generally came up with very little. And uh, the story has in fact come to our days with terms such as the enigma of frontal lobe behavior, a term that Hans Lucas Teuber, a famous neuropsychologist, used, uh, the mystery of frontal lobe function, and people had not really had a handle on this. You certainly cannot explain these people's behaviors by something as narrow as a problem with logical uh, uh, disturbance or a disturbance of attention or of working memory. So let me tell you where we are right now. And where we are is this. For one thing, it appears now that the patients that have the closest to what one could call the gauge condition uh, are patients that have damage in one particular sector of the frontal lobe rather than all of the frontal lobe. And that sector happens to be the ventral medial. You're here looking at the brain from below and you're seeing one such patient. And you see that the medial part, this is the medial part of the right hemisphere, and here the medial part of the left, uh, is the, where the, the damage centers. And when you plot uh, many such patients, in this case there are four of our star patients with frontal lobe damage of this type, uh, you, have, you, you get the idea of the systems that are most commonly involved. The other thing that is very obvious is that these individuals, th that is not to be read, by the way, don't worry, I will walk you through it. These individuals have a remarkable uh, uh, history in the sense that, for instance, in this particular patient, uh, this is a man that is very intelligent, currently has an IQ of over 140. This is a patient that has been studied uh, by my colleague Stephen Anderson. Uh, and this man uh, has a very good education, uh, and he actually had a very good career up to the time in 1982 when he, when he had a neurological event that produced a lesion of this type. And what has happened after that is a whole catalog of catastrophes in personal and social terms. The professional activities can no longer be followed. The, 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 the marriage and the relations to friends fall apart. And these individuals, in spite of a remarkable intelligence, are no longer able to guide their life in such a way that all of these marvelous relations that constitute our social fabric can be maintained. And even in, in the personal realm, where it concerns a spouse or children, those fall apart. The sense of responsibility in a job falls apart, and they cannot be counted on to continue working well. And we end up in the situation of this person, who by now has accumulated a lot of debt, is virtually isolated, has no job prospects whatsoever, in spite of an IQ that reads over 140 and is in the genius range. Now, to dramatize the level of dissociation we have here, I cannot resist reading you a little passage from this, from the, this patient's protocol to get you an idea of what it is to be a person who can no longer operate in society and constantly makes errors of judgment in relation to others and who, in a task in which he is asked to produce uh, what we call alternative thinking, is asked to produce options of action for another person, he comes up with the following responses. So patient DV is asked the following, hypothetical. There is another person called Victor who wants people to listen to him, but no one ever does. What can Vic Victor do to get listened to? And you don't need to read that. I'll read it to you. 
here's the, the responses that our patient, who cannot navigate socially in real life, in real time, here's the response he gave to the, to the question. Make sure that he wants the right kind of people to listen to him. That is, people who care for him. He can learn to articulate what he's saying so he's not boring. He can establish eye contact and become more animated so that he thinks what he's saying is important. Sometimes you can encourage people to listen to you if you are a good listener, but other times people are pretty dense. They just don't pick up on it. He could write a note to those he cares about and say, look, I've really got to talk and nobody seems to listen. Would you be willing to set aside some time just to listen to me? I guess the thing I would say is learn how to be a friend yourself and you will attract the right kind of friends. Hopefully, he could take a course like how to win friends and influence people. He could develop a pen pal and express his thoughts in writing. He could take a writing course at the university, and on and on. And what you have when you read through this response, and there are many that he produces, is a first-rate intelligence at work, being able to come up with a very large collection of options that would be available to our hypothetical victor person who was not able to get friends to listen to him. And what you're seeing is a dissociation again between the conserved knowledge that this man has about how one might act and his real-time, real-life behavior where that knowledge is no longer applicable or applied and where he clearly does not follow it. So it poses all sorts of questions that should make you think. Does a person who behaves very wrongly in society do that because he wants to do that or do that because he doesn't have the knowledge to behave better? Well, we don't know and it depends on the conditions and they have to be uh, 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 studied uh, specially in, in every, each individual. Now, the situation where we are right now is that we can see that these individuals do not have a problem of logical competence in any way, shape or form and that after all is said and done what is most remarkable about these individuals, in addition to their very abnormal behavior in real life, is that they have a remarkable, abnormal processing of emotion and feeling. And that is something that was not always apparent to me, but became apparent to me several years ago, and it led me to a hypothesis which we have now been testing in our laboratory for quite some time and which is known as the somatic marker hypothesis. In a nutshell, what it concerns is this. I have, I, I raise the possibility that what is wrong in these individuals is the loss of a signal which is actually coming from their emotional and feeling process which allows or would have allowed them to mark a particular option and a particular consequence of an action as good or bad. And what this really says in a broader context is this. It is quite possible that the way we steer our behavior as adults, and in fact as children too, is not just by following knowledge charts and following a logical competence uh, that would uh, move, make us move from A to B to, to Z, but rather using that logical competence after we have been pointed into the right part of the decision-making space by a signal that is very basic, that is biologically based, that is quite related to emotion and feeling, and quite related to what emotion and feeling ultimately express, which is biological regulation. This is the hypothesis in a nutshell. It is not, by the way, that we think with our emotions or that we decide with hunches and gut feelings. It's more than that. What I'm claiming is that if you lose the ability of having some hunches and gut feelings set you at the beginning of your reasoning process in the proper course, you may never be able to get there. But once you get the proper hunch, you still need to use your deliberation, you still need to use your knowledge and logic in order to get at the proper harbor. That's the point in the hypothesis. Now let me just close by telling you about uh, one experiment uh, that we have done that relates uh, uh, to this particular topic. Many have been done in our lab, and I'm going to describe you a task that was developed by a postdoctoral student of mine, Antoine Bechara, another brilliant Canadian, uh, and the task goes like this. 
um, you have in front of you four decks of um, four decks of cards. We, we call this a gambling text, and the decks are marked A, B, C, and D. You also have uh, in front of you as the player, in other words, the subject, which can be a patient or a, a normal individual. You also have a loan of money, in this case $2,000 of play money. And we're going to try to make this game very much like real life, in which you know a little bit but you don't know everything and you're going to have to be governed by the discoveries you make about what could regulate that life. And what we tell the subject is this, look, you've got $2,000, we want you to play this game in a way such that you will minimize your losses and, if possible, maximize your gains. We just don't want you to lose money. And you're going to play the game by turning cards from any of the decks in whatever order you want. We'll not tell you how many cards you have to turn and we'll not tell you the order. And we'll tell you one more thing, is that every time you turn a card, you're going to be given some money and at times when you turn cards, you may also be asked to pay some money. And that's where our, the knowledge stops. We don't say anything else, the game starts. And the person starts taking cards. Well, what happens is that unbeknownst to the player, just like in life, two of those decks are actually pretty good. They happen to be decks C and D, where every time you pull a card, you get $50, but Every now and then you have to pay a penalty, but the penalty is very low. On the other hand, there are these two decks, A and E, where every time you turn a card you get $100, but every now and then you get a penalty that makes you lose your shirt. So you, get, you, you can run, say, four times on, on deck A, and all of a sudden you're told, by the way, you get $100, but now you pay me $750, or you pay me $1,000, which is very different from the other. So, unbeknownst to the player, if you're going to play on these two decks, you're going to lose money. But if you're going to play on these two, you're going to make money. And here's what normal individuals play like. You have a normal control chart on top. And this is very consistent, and it's so amazing that it's actually consistent across cultures. It's consistent across ages and education, and even consistent across high risk takers and low risk takers is that after a while, people realize that there's something the matter with the A and B decks, and they move to the C and D, and that's where they stay most of the time until at a 100 card turn, you say, you stop. The person comes out ahead. Now look at the performance of one of our ventromedial frontal lobe patients, the ones that have, in real life, such problems with rationality. What you see is something quite amazing, is that they persist on going to the A and B decks, and in fact they do very few choices from the C and D. Now, there are many ways of interpreting this, but let me tell you what's most important first of all. First, this is a task that for the first time allows us to detect and measure in a laboratory setting this kind of problem that had always eluded neuropsychological testing. Second, it tells you that it may well be that these individuals are in fact being controlled by the present circumstances, by the here and now, and they are quite driven by, in part, the, the lure of the high yield that those decks give, the A and the B, but also, at the same time, by the inability to mark the bad scenario that inevitably will come out of choosing A and B because ultimately it should become clear after a while, certainly after about 20 turns, as in everybody else, that you're going to lose money given the very high degree of penalties. Somehow, these in incredibly intelligent people continue to play the game of the, in the Bashara task the same way they play the game of life. It's a game in which they're going to lose, ultimately. Now, let me tell you, we can skip this, this just plots the general profile of a typical control and of a patient, and these, these uh, differences are, are remarkably significant. But now let me tell you about something else that we did, which was actually suggested by Hannah, and which was the following. Since our basic interpretation is that this defect corresponds to a lack of an internal signal 
that would steer these people away from the bad decks and into the good ones, we decided to look at to monitor skin conductance responses continuously while these individuals play the game. And the very interesting thing is that these individuals do have good skin conductance responses. As you can see here, you have here for instance a control, has brain damage but not in the frontal lobe. And here we have the, uh, the skin conductance responses to uh, a deep breath and to clapping in our patient DVR, which is one of our well-known patients with this problem. And you can see that the skin conductance responses are quite uh, robust and are in fact indistinguishable from normal. So we know that the apparatus to produce skin conductance is normal in these individuals with damage to the ventromedial frontal lobe. Now, here's what happens when you monitor the performance over a long period in the card game, we realize that in the period that precedes a choice and that corresponds to the patient thinking about the choice and then beginning to move out the hand towards the deck, you start developing a progressively higher response of skin conductance and it turns out that it is for dex A and dex B, the ones that are bad, that you produce the highest skin conductance response. In other words, there is something being generated in the four seconds that precede the actual choice that uh, is clearly physiological at that point, that varies over time, is related to the amount of experience the patient is getting, and is in fact related to the negative experience. And it is something that you might in fact interpret as a physiological signal that the brain is clearly sending to the body relative to the alarming nature of decks A and B relative to decks uh, C and D, which are the good decks. Now let me tell you what happens to the patients. And now you have a comparison. You have the top one, which corresponds to the average of 19 controls. And here you have target patients, which at this measurement I think were five. And what you see is that those patients are not generating any of the anticipatory responses. The inevitable conclusion is that, in fact, contrary to the normal individuals, there is no machinery of anticipation for this response, uh, and the patients are indistinguishable ac across all decks. One little, uh, one little wrinkle in this, which is a marvelous one, is that we have now been interrupting the, the task early on and we ask the patient, we ask the subjects and or the patients uh, what is going on. And it's quite obvious that by the time these first responses are emerging, the subjects have no idea whatsoever that there are good decks and bad decks, and they're still going through the process of sorting out what may be happening. In other words, it may well be that in advance of our conscious, deliberate decision that some decks are good and some decks are bad, in fact, the brain is already responding to the repeated punishments by creating a signal. In other words, there is a biological machinery that is operating in advance of our cognizance that there is good and evil in the world. Okay? Let me close by showing you this image. And it is an image of my idea at the moment of what it is to create a neurobiology of systems for emotion and feeling. And it looks complicated, but it's actually very simple. Up on top, you have something that I've called the object. You could conceive of that object as, for instance, a person that you really think is evil uh, and that is really frightening the living daylights out of you, or, for instance, a grizzly bear that you might encounter uh, on a trip. Uh, and what we believe happens in terms of the creation of emotion and feeling, which we believe is so important for the generation of a decision uh, uh, process, is in fact the processing of that, let's say it's a visual object, in early sensory cortices, and then the processing through higher order cortices, such that a lot of knowledge can be correlated with that object, and all of that, in my idea, being represented in, in early sensory cortices. But then something happens which relates to the unique experience that each of us has had, 
through the process of education and acculturation, and which involves both prefrontal cortices as well as a set of structures known collectively as the limbic system. They include such structures as the amygdala, the anterior cingulate cortex, and the hypothalamus. Those structures, by the way, are those that are most active in the regulation of our survival processes. You cannot have life without them. They regulate the internal milieu, they re regulate the biochemical panorama of our bodies, they also regulate our appetites and instincts, our drives, which ultimately are critical in order to maintain the survival of an individual or the species. What we think happens is that as this processing is happening, and this processing is, by the way, not just sequential, but a bit more parallel than is represented here, we then generate a set of responses that are marked at this level, where I'm pointing now. There are these four major lines of response. And one goes to autonomic nuclei and can generate such things as a change in the heart rate or in the rhythm at which we breathe or in skin conductance. Uh, and those are the things that have for millennia allowed us to sense that when we are emoting, something changes in our body, something in our visceral response to what is happening, whether it be good or bad. We also have changes that occur towards the motor system, for instance, using the basal ganglia. And those allow us to change our posture, to change our musculoskeletal arrangements such that we react with a certain body language to a particular object. And then we also have responses that are endocrine and peptide. You, know, you have loss of neuropeptides and uh, hormones that are being sent not as a neural signal, not through the nerves into the body, but rather into the body, out of the bloodstream, and change the way the body is operating. And finally, you have a set of responses that go towards neurotransmitter nuclei located in two areas that some of you may not have heard about, but I call the brain stem and the basal forebrain. And it is there that in small nuclei, substances such as acetylcholine, dopamine, serotonin are being manufactured. Now let me take you to what this produces. What this produces massively, especially those three first boxes on the left, is a change in the body. As a result of the object, the body is going to change and the entire landscape of how our body is, is going to be different in the thousand milliseconds that, that uh, follow our seeing a particular object. And that is what I call the emotional body state. Incidentally, a lot of this same idea was developed by William James at the end of the 19th century and it is an absolutely superb idea that unfortunately was not properly followed up by neurobiology during the 20th century. Now, William James did not know about these responses here, which are very important, nor did he know about the pathways that we had to put this together. Now, the fact is that out of the basal forebrain and the, and the brain stem, we can then respond also to all levels of the brain and modify the way those brain networks are operating and out of the body itself, through a tremendous number of neural lines, we can get to make the representation of the changed body state in the somatosensory cortex. So, in a nutshell, what I think is happening, and this is a perfectly testable hypothesis, to the human brain and body, in fact, to the human organism, when we emote, is a concerted change in the body proper, that gets to be represented as a particular picture, if you want, no different in terms of cognition from the representing of one of the pictures that David Hubel talked to you about, except that this one is in somatosensory cortices and it so happens that it is more the ones on the right hemisphere than the ones on the left. But then on top of that, there's also a new change that happens in many of these networks that are made to work at different speeds and with different efficiencies under the agency of many of those neurotransmitters that act on the same structures at the same time. So there's a very complex package and it is this complex package of changes directed at the brain itself and directed at the body but represented back into the brain that I think constitutes the base of a feeling. Now, I think that feelings are in fact what humans for millennia have considered the very core of their souls. Uh, I think that feelings are 
part and parcel of the process of biological regulation, it would be extremely unlikely that they would not have a major role to play in the steering of behavior. They obviously do in, in non-languaged animals, and I think they do in humans as well. And so the process of reason, as we can now begin to uh, carve it and fractionate it in, in neurobiological research of systems, is not certainly like Descartes would have wanted. It is not something that is born out of thought, and it is not something that is born out of language. It existed for long before in evolution, and it existed very close to the regulation of life processes. Thank you very much. David, you are here. Great. Thank you very much. Oh, some beautiful pictures. Of I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a good work, isn't it? Water and zip. What? What did you say? Water and zip. I don't want to say it through the microphone. <laughs> a signal for whoever wants to respond we'll commentary from each of you before we go ahead. So. Do I have to answer? Just, just okay. something brief? To answer. <laughs> some <laughs> coming up with, yeah, we'll come with some questions from the audience. Try to honor some of those too. Does anybody have I think Dr. Kendall wants to speak. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Kendall, we'll uh, start with the first question here. Uh, the, the reason I think we're slow in formulating questions is that Tony has given us really so much to think about. I, I'm still working to assimilate uh, his view of the interaction between emotion and rationality in the execution of behavior. And in speaking to David Hubel, while we were both enjoying the talk, several thoughts struck me which I thought that Tony might elaborate on. First, I think I'm right in saying that the area in the prefrontal cortex that was damaged in Phineas Gage and in several of your patients also is importantly involved in autonomic regulation. And I wonder whether in simple terms one of the defects these patients might be suffering from is an inability to this is restating what you're saying, because of this defect in the autonomic nervous system, there might be a defect in the handling of feedback signals or even the ability to generate it. So this is really a defect in the autonomic nervous system, number one. And in that context, I wonder whether you would take us through the James Lang, the Cannon Bard, the Stanley Schachter, and the Damasio theory, and point out to us the modern evolution of thinking about the biological base of emotion. So to distinguish the various generational views of that. <laughs> it's a tall order, another tall order. <laughs> David and I have had interesting questions today, just the whole day to answer them. Uh, now, first with your, your uh, point about autonomic r regulation. It's, by the way, it's very interesting to think that there is really so much ignorance in our neurobiological knowledge. And, and for those in the audience that think that, for instance, everything would be known about the autonomic nervous system, let me tell you that there's an area where there's tremendous lack of knowledge. Nobody has actually mapped all the pathways of, uh, of uh, uh, autonomic nervous system, or for that matter, of pain. In the, in the macaque monkey, let alone the human. So there, there are vast areas of ignorance that we still have. But there's no question that there are many centers that regulate, and those are real centers, that regulate the autonomic function. The ventromedial is not a major 
autonomic regulator that clearly overrides. So the, the way we see it is this. S critical autonomic regulators exist in hypothalamus, in amygdala, certainly in brainstem. And then there are structures, like for instance the cingulate or the ventromedial, that probably have a control of higher order over those other structures. So for instance, ventromedial projects heavily to the amygdala, has a, a, a feedback response, and when you lose that control, you're going to lose the ability to control, for instance, amygdala under certain circumstances. Because the, 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 the autonomic function is there, very, very well preserved. It's just the circumstances that change. And so under certain circumstances, it cannot operate. Now, getting back to, to uh, and, and as I showed in that slide, the autonomic signal is perfect when it comes to a physiological response. The, 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 the story on James is very important, and I, I, I would like to, to start by saying that we've had a very long, dark night for studies in emotion throughout the 20th century. For reasons that I won't go into, uh, the beautiful work of William James, of Charles Darwin, and of Freud were in fact leading us into something that would have become sooner the neurobiology of emotion. And in fact, the, the biological perspective was there in Darwin. Uh, James had an organismic perspective that I think is beautiful, and certainly Freud was mining the, the role of emotion in psychopathology. But throughout the 20th century, perhaps because emotion was seen as intangible and a nebulous, not very uh, objective affair, the drive was towards so-called cognitive studies. Uh, and then I think after the computer metaphor of mid-century, this was, became even more marked. It is totally incomprehensible to me why people to this day separate studies in studies of cognition and emotion as if we could have cognition without emotion, which is clearly absurd. But that's the state of affairs. So there was a long gap. Now, part of the gap... But certainly, um, Cannon and Bard and, and Stan Schachter... True, but there was not... The, the, the influence, certainly in, in mainstream neuroscience, the influence was minimal. There has been no symposium on emotion at the Society for Neuroscience for 15 years. That ought to tell us something. Um, what I think happens, to, to, just to go back to James, is that he had a beautiful idea. The idea suffered from several shortcomings. One, he made the body component of the loop a necessity. He did not uh, admit that there, the body could be bypassed. Like, for instance, in my full theory or hypothesis, I prefer to call it, uh, the body can be bypassed because the body can be symbolized. So we have what I call the, the body loop and the as-if loop. So after a while, uh, the, the brain can learn to generate a simulation of a body state, avoiding the highly uneconomic loop through the body and using the very slow autonomic nervous system to generate changes. This is something that James never thought about. And most of the criticism in James, against James was directed at that lack. People did not want to admit that uh, the thing always had to involve the body, although we all know from our experience that in fact a lot of the time emotion does involve a body change. The second thing, and probably the most uh, problematic, was that James did not think about anything but what I now call primary emotion. He thought about emotions that would be the kind of response that you have to the grizzly bear, which are totally dispositional, inherited, uh, available prior to learning and development. And those responses would appear without any kind of evaluation on the part of the subject. So you see the thing and you get a response. Now it's perfectly obvious that in most circumstances we react with emotions, especially when we're dealing with complex emotions that relate to our social and personal affairs, we react with an emotion filtered by an evaluation that is critically tied to the way we have developed as individuals and to our knowledge and to the dicta of the society we live in. And that's what James had no allowance for. And I don't think he should be criticized for that because it was a beautiful beginning, but it was just hammered on the necessity of the body loop, 
and on the lack of an evaluation. And clearly, the only thing that has really evolved, I think, in this century is the notion that there is an evaluation that is needed a lot of the time, although not all the time. That's how I would put it. Just a brief question? Churchill? Um, yeah, I'm going to try to make this as brief as I can. Um, one of the things that we are advised to do as we grow up and one of the things we advise our children to do is to learn self-control. So, and the model that of that that's usually presented is that we want to have reason controlling emotion. That, that you can see what or understand what a certain course of action requires and even though you may feel fearful or you may feel abhorrent or whatever, that reason requires that you do it. Um, now, I s foresee some changes in, the, in that ideal, given what you've said, but how do you understand the process, then, of, of acquiring self-control so that the, the, the heart doesn't always rule the head? The, I think it's a process that, that, it, that I really describe as that of, of secondary emotion. It's a process in which you can, uh, you, you, you can harness your responses uh, and you can adapt them to, to, uh, to especially to, to social and cultural controls. Um, it is something that you can probably do. I, I, I don't think I know exactly how one achieves that. I, I, I never thought about the, about the process. But it's a process that is not unlike that of habituation and desensitization uh, by probably by repetition uh, of, uh, of the of the of, of the situation, but it's certainly a very critical process. And I think that the again the, the the big difference is that the primary emotions are sort of a stock that we have, a, a, a set of dispositions that that are probably species uh, specific, and that will come into play pretty much given the same situation. Whereas the secondary emotions are culturally. Uh, bound and will come into play very much depending on what the development of an individual has been like. There's an enormous room for variation in that. All we need to do is look at the different cultures uh, and what they in fact allow in terms of expression of emotion. Dr. Bjorklund? Yeah, I would like just yes, briefly to come back to an issue that was uh, brought up this morning, that is the binding problem. Um, I'm thinking of your description of um, uh, elements in the uh, temporal law being able to I act to identify faces, for example, um, and that neurons deep in the uh, temporal lobe, in fact, may be responsive uniquely to such elements in the picture. Now, we heard from uh, David Ubel's uh, presentation that <coughs> the visual image is not basically processed in that way. It's uh, parallelly divided up into uh, elements. And how come then that uh, a specialized area can have such a um, unique function with respect to uh, the um, uh, components of the visual picture when it's not processed in that way? Do you see this as a problem when it comes to uh, t tying anatomy to uh, processing in the brain or would you um, could you comment this could you see an, uh, no. a good anatomical yeah. substrate for this? no I, 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 I don't see it as a problem at all I think that for instance, if you look at the architecture that for instance the connectional anatomists have been putting together for us uh, leading all the way from primary cortices into the vast expansion of the early sensory cortices, very similarly in visual or auditory systems. And then the convergence through different hierarchies towards what I would call epical points, uh, such as the anterior temporal lobe, the entorhinal cortex, or certain apices that are located in, in, uh, in frontal lobe, what you see, actually, is that because of the recursive nature of the architecture, because of the fact that you always project forward but you reciprocate backward, you can maintain a, a, a dialogue across the entire hierarchy, not to mention the heterarchical connections. Now, the way I see, for instance, an anterior temporal region that, say, will light up, quote unquote, in a PET scan uh, in relation to faces, it's not that that region contains those faces represented there. 
On the contrary, what that region does is be activated because it will connect and make linkages between many, many parts that are in earlier cortices that when properly activated will define, say, your particular face in a particular context. So I think that the only place in the brain, quote unquote, where you have coherent images is not one area, but actually a collection of early sensory areas. I do not believe that those images are ever transferred down the pike into another area. What I think there are is linkages. And in a way, what the anterior temporal lobe structures of frontal are doing is holding the capacity to activate back such that you reconstitute on the moment, on the fly, as it were, a particular image. But you don't have those images up front. And I think that we can say that with some confidence because we know the result of lesions in anterior temporal lobe structures. And we know that the people that have those lesions have not lost the ability to generate the most beautiful images in the world. It's just that they have lost the ability to relate those images to proper previous knowledge. So it, it really has to do with the basic conception that we, we use for the brain. If we're going to conceive of the brain as in the traditional terms of a sequence of processors that ends up in the anterior parts of the brain, be them temporal or frontal, with the gorgeous cinemascope pictures, we're going to be in trouble because there's no such things as those pictures in the brain, in all likelihood. But if we, if we go through the almost absurd view at first hand that, in fact, the place where you have the pictures when you see is the place where you're going to have all pictures when you recall them, which a lot of cognitive neuropsychology is now pointing to, then I think we'll be in better, in better terms. But can one interpret this such that uh, a picture can actually be stored in the brain so that we can, for, for example, recall it? If we, I think what you if store... we think of our, uh, yeah. okay. uh, a face we know well, yeah. we can see it in front of us, which uh, represents a degree of okay. recall. Okay. But it means that the picture is never assembled in one place. Okay. We shouldn't understand it that way. Right. Uh, Understood. What I think happens is that you have the potential for the reconstruction. What I think we have is the recipe for the reconstruction of a face or anything else that you know well. So you are on the moment, you go out of that, you could call it coding, and you come back and you reenact activities in the brain that are similar, though perhaps not quite equal, to the activities that once happened during perception. So I think recall is nothing but an attempt at replicating the process of perception. And that's the reason why we don't recall as perfectly as we perceive. But it is a process of reconstruction. And the image that you get in the recalled picture, when if I now ask you to think about your house in Lund, uh, you're going to come up with a picture. It's not as vivid as your perception of it, but it will be a picture and it has coherence as much as it does in, in perception, but it's going to be recalled on a moment. And if your house changes, if you do an addition on it 10 years from now, you're going to recall another picture that will include that addition. But it's all reconstructed. I don't believe that you have files with pictures, with Polaroids stuck into your brain that you can pull out like you do from the, um, from the filing cabinet. That's the big difference. Okay, we're gonna, um, there were a number of questions that were provoked that uh, asked about criminals and criminal behavior. Um, I think I'm going to uh, read two or three of them just to give you a flavor and then uh, ask you to respond um, maybe to a central question. I understand that Dr. Churchland may be raising questions that have to do with responsibility, so we probably won't move away from this topic too far, but th these are questions um, that have come from the audience. Has there been any study done on criminal behavior using PET for localization of possible lesions common to this behavior? Um, your presentation suggests that many asocial behaviors may be related to the ventral medial frontal defect or damage. Are our prisons, jails, institutions a holding tank for people with these brain problems? Um, this may be more philosophical than scientific, but given the influence of your um, assignation of ventral medial dysfunction, how might that influence uh, the civilized response to criminality? In other words, 
Uh, can we uh, write criminals off as largely biological phenomenon? Um, all of these seem to be asking, essentially, have you found an area in the brain that predicts um, asocial behavior in a very general way? And of course, that could raise a, the specter of could we use this in a predictive diagnostic fashion? Um, can you tell us something about the limitations of um, diagnosis with respect to this? Well, as, as you can imagine, this is a, an incredibly complex subject and you can, cannot do justice to it with, with bullets, uh, with just one-liners. You know, one However, there are certain things that I, I definitely want to make clear. One is that the kind of individuals that we're describing normally do not have what we would call criminal behavior. This is very important for you to realize. N nor did, for instance, poor old Phineas Gage have criminal behavior as such. Now, we think that they don't because these are individuals that have, in fact, had a normal process, not only of brain maturation, but also of education and socialization. So all of these individuals have had the onset of their brain damage late in life, at least as adults, and therefore they can rely on a previous structure and on a lot of knowledge that certainly curbs the worst of those impulses. It doesn't mean though that there are not conditions in which there can be criminal behavior. In fact, we have now studied some cases which are a variant of these but not equal in which people do have criminal behavior and in fact it can be traced to a system. The second thing is that there's no, no one area. We're talking about a complex system, and as anything in neurobiology, you have to understand it in terms of levels. There are molecular levels. There, there are cellular synaptic circuitries. There are the neurotransmitters that work at those circuitries. Then you have larger scale systems. And then you have the relation to a social environment in which those individuals have lived. So any attempt by anybody to try to reduce criminal behavior to something as simple as a gene or a, a transmitter as serotonin or a, a, a hole in the brain is of course uh, very dangerous and certainly wrong. <clears throat> you have to understand it all, all these multiple levels and you have to understand that all of these factors can be uh, brought to bear. I'm perfectly convinced that there are individuals that have abnormal behavior and criminal behavior because of many of these causes. Some genetic factors, some factors that are neurobiological and were acquired, like for instance an infection at birth, or a stroke, or an encephalitis, or what have you. All of that is true. But there are also individuals that I'm ready to believe have criminal behavior because of social circumstances in which they are inserted. So let's not have easy way out in this and think that everything from the social environment to the genome can have an influence and that's exactly how it should when we think that this is some of the most complex behaviors that you can deal with. The, the exact proportions uh, in the interplay are something to be sorted out by appropriate research. However, there's no such research yet. I would just make one uh, point that is socio-cultural is that uh, I am not aware that people want to study the problem of criminality and violence from a point of view of science. And very often you resort to political issues and to political solutions. It really doesn't pay to uh, incarcerate people or kill them if you don't understand the causes of criminal behavior and of violence. And those problems are certainly amenable to research if you just have the appropriate uh, attitude, I think. Okay, thank you very much. We, uh, <laughs> I'd like to uh, inform you that there will be coffee and cookies on the mall, Ekman Mall, outside uh, in the main area of the college, and uh, welcome you back for our 3.30 talk with uh, Dr. Churchland. Thank you very much. Yes, I've seen the, the emotion has.